Hello everybody and welcome to the DSLR workshop. I'm your host, Steven Zeller, and uh, we're here today to kick off our first episode. We're going to talk about all kinds of exciting things from what the show is all about to uh, some camera basics and get you started off on the right foot so you can take your snapshots, turn them into some really great photographs. All right, so the reason we created this show is I was looking around and I was trying to find some great resources for photographers who had just bought a digital SLR camera or DSLR. Uh, some of the camera manufacturers out there today like Nikon, uh, Sony, and Canon for example uh, are really marketing the digital SLR cameras to consumers but there's not a lot of resources for them to learn. Uh, the camera manuals don't really explain everything. Uh, they're not that you know, thorough. They'll give you the, the explanation of what all the features are and what each button does. But that really doesn't help you make better photographs. And so that's the reason I created the show was to come up with a way to give a, a free internet podcast to uh, users who can view the stuff, go out and apply it, and actually turn their photography uh, into something that they can really appreciate and something that others will appreciate even more as well. So I uh, hope you'll join with me. Uh, like I said, this is the first episode, and uh, we're going to continue this on every week. Um, it'll be great. It'll be a lot of fun, and uh, we'll do some fun stuff either in the studio or out on location, uh, depending on what we'll do. We'll cover all kinds of different topics, but the focus is making better pictures. Uh, cameras are great, but gear doesn't make pictures. Photographers do, all right? So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, down here in front of me, I know you can't see it, but I've got three different cameras here. They're all uh, digital SLRs, and we'll cover all of them. First one I'm gonna grab here, this is a Nikon D200, okay? This is uh, would be considered a pro-level camera and uh, uh, really great camera, very solid, um, takes great pictures, okay? Uh, technically, it takes very good pictures, all right? Um, but that's a D200. I've also got a Nikon D90. Now, this is the camera that I shoot with personally. Uh, this is considered like a prosumer model camera. Um, it's got some more advanced features for the advanced amateur or professional photographer uh, who's looking to be able to do a little bit more with their camera. But, again, it's just a tool. And then finally, I've got a Nikon D40. This was my uh, uh, very first digital SLR, and uh, if you can't tell, I'm a Nikon shooter. Um, but this camera, all the same functions as the other digital SLRs, a few less bells and whistles, but all those bells and whistles do are just extra tools to make your job a little bit easier. So can I take great pictures with this camera? Absolutely. Will it be as easy as, say, the D200 or the D90? Maybe not quite so much. Might have to work a little bit harder, but the pictures will still come out great. All right, so out of these three cameras, which one takes the best picture? Well, it's kind of a trick question. All of them take the best picture because if I take bad pictures with a D40, I'm also going to take bad pictures with a D200, okay? The camera is not gonna improve the quality of my images. Um, it's not gonna make them any better. Uh, as far as technical quality, yes. The uh, images coming out of the D200 and the D90 are going to be better than the D40, technically speaking. But we're not worried about that. We're worried about photography, and photography is about making great pictures, pictures that um, speak for themselves, pictures that evoke emotion, uh, that evoke a response, and that's what matters, all right? So continuing on, I'm going to pick up my D90 here, and uh, we're going to talk about some basics. One of my goals is to be able to get you out of the auto mode, okay? Uh, every camera has it. Uh, by the way, this show is also great for point-and-shoot photographers. If you don't have a digital SLR, uh, you can also apply these to your point-and-shoot because a lot of the same features apply uh, and some of the settings apply to point-and-shoot cameras as well as digital SLRs. All right, so on my camera here, I've got a mode dial selector switch, okay? And it doesn't matter if you've got an Icon or a Canon. A lot of them have this same type of mode dial switch. Okay, and I've got everything here from auto to... Uh, no flash, to portrait mode, to landscape mode, macro mode, sports mode, nighttime mode, and then I've got some program functions here. Uh, one called P, which stands for program auto. S stands for shutter priority mode. A stands for aperture priority mode. And M stands for manual. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to concentrate on those four selections because those are the ones that are really going to matter. Some of these other automatic modes really don't recommend them because what we're going to do with this show is teach you how to use these four modes to your advantage to get the most out of your camera as opposed to relying on uh, the camera's processor to make decisions for you. So 
what we'll do is let's talk about automatic mode first. What does automatic mode do for you? Well, it does a lot of things. It takes all your exposure decisions and lets the camera choose those for you. So the camera decides what the best aperture is, what the best shutter speed is, what the best ISO is. And we'll talk about those three things here in just a second. Um, it also decides whether or not you need to use flash. Okay, cameras have um, a really intelligent meter in here that lets it know what the exposure is. It's essentially a light meter and says, hey, this is you know, what the exposure is. This is what you need to set the camera at to make a great photograph, right? To make a properly exposed photograph according to the camera, which is a computer, okay? Um, I prefer to let the brain make that decision and my eyes make that decision as opposed to the camera. All right, so that's automatic mode. Now, programmed auto mode, as you see as I switch it over to the P, what that mode is, is it's essentially auto mode, and really what it doesn't do is it doesn't allow you to use the pop-up flash automatically. I can still pop the flash up, but if I take an underexposed shot and I should be using flash, it's not going to pop the flash up automatically for you. I'm going to have to consciously make a decision to uh, pop that flash up on my own, right? So that's what programmed auto does. All right, before I get into the other three modes, let's talk about aperture, let's talk about shutter speed, and let's talk about ISO, all right? First thing, aperture, okay? Aperture is the size of the hole in the lens that allows light to come through, okay? So we can adjust that size to allow more or less light. Now to explain aperture just a little bit, the way aperture works as far as terms of values, we also call them f-stops, okay? And those f-stops have a number attached to it, and the funny thing about aperture is the smaller the number, the larger the aperture. So it's inversely proportional or backwards. Um, and the larger the number, the smaller the aperture. All right, so aperture allows a certain amount of light to come through our lens into our camera, and that's what that setting is. Now shutter speed is when your shutter opens, the shutter opens and exposes the image to that light and to that scene that you're gonna photograph. So when the shutter opens and we talk about shutter speed, we're talking about the duration of time that the shutter is open. And uh, those can go from, uh, typically on today's cameras, from 30 seconds, or if you have a bulb mode, they can go for an unlimited amount of time, as long as you depress the shutter button, uh, all the way to a 4,000th of a second, or an 8,000th of a second, which is extremely fast. So, that being said, let's move to shutter priority mode and talk about what that does for our camera. Shutter priority mode, what it does is allows you to select your shutter speed and the camera decides what aperture to use. So when would you wanna use this mode? Primarily you wanna use it when you're photographing action. So let's say you're doing sports, animals that are moving, something like that. What you'll do is you'll set it to shutter priority mode and you'll select a shutter speed that will allow you to freeze the action and then your camera will make its aperture decision all on its own. So you don't have to worry about it. You just know that you've got a shutter speed set fast enough to freeze the action. Also, you can use it when you want to set up a shot, say that you want to photograph something that you want to be very slow. Uh, let's say you want to get light trails from a highway. So you get the headlights and the taillights moving through the photograph so it looks like one continuous light. Then you would use a very slow shutter speed, but you can also use shutter priority mode. All right, and then our next mode is aperture priority mode. And it's exactly the opposite. Aperture priority mode allows you to use the aperture that you would like so I can select, say, an aperture of f4, and then the camera decides what best shutter speed to use. Again, a primarily opportunity to use this is when you're taking portraits, you're taking pictures of people, um, and you want to limit your depth of field, which is how much of the photograph is in focus. And so aperture priority mode is very good for that. I either shoot in aperture priority mode most of the time or in manual priority mode, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, I mentioned ISO. What ISO is, is it's a sensitivity of the camera to light. Uh, think of it in terms of film speed, which used to be called ASA. Uh, ASA, you had ASA 100, ASA 50, 200, 400, 800, so on, right? And it was also called the speed of film. Well, digital has the same thing, except we call it ISO. Uh, for the Nikons, a native ISO is ISO 200, which would be like putting 200 speed film into your camera. Uh, for Canons, their native ISO is ISO 100. So when we think about that, ISO also allows us to affect exposure, especially in more low light situations where we can change those things. And we'll cover more on that later, but I just wanted to make sure I touched on that for you. Now, when we go into manual mode, 
Manual mode gives me complete control over everything in the camera. It allows me to set my aperture, it allows me to set my shutter speed, and I can control everything that I want in relationship to exposure, all with my dials here on the camera. Now, is it unique only to my D90? No. I can also do this on the D200 and on the D40. Now, one thing I will tell you about the D200 is the D200 and other professional grade cameras don't contain a auto mode. They have a programmed auto, aperture priority, shutter priority, and manual mode. And that's it. And that's because they know that most of the people that are going to be using those types of cameras aren't going to be relying on the macro mode or the night shot mode or the landscape mode. All they're worried about primarily is going to be those four settings, programmed auto, shutter priority, aperture priority, and manual mode. All right. So remember that, that some of the higher end cameras uh, that are designed for more for professional use, uh, they don't have those automatic modes. All right. So those are some of the basic modes that you have when you're operating your camera. And again, like I said, it doesn't matter whether I'm using the D90 or the D200, neither one of it is necessarily going to make a better picture for me. Uh, one of the things that is going to make the largest difference as far as uh, picture quality is me. And that comes down to things like composition and it comes down to uh, photographing something very interesting. Okay. Um, there's some other little simple rules that we'll talk about later on in uh, future episodes to cover that. But uh, for now, you have some of the basics of some of your modes and your cameras. All right. So from there, we'll move on to one other thing that I like to talk about for today. And that's some of the basic uh, features that you can use on your camera that'll help protect your camera a little bit. All right. And I know some of this may sound very elementary, very basic, and uh, if you're a more advanced user, please bear with us, but I wanna make sure that we cover all this stuff for uh, uh, all of our users. Okay, as you can see right here on uh, this camera, I have what's called a lens hood. Okay, and what the lens hood does is the lens hood gives me the ability to uh, filter out, or not filter rather, but block out light from coming into the lens and causing lens flare. And it also does one other thing for me. And what that does is it protects the lens. If I bang it around or bump it into something, I'm not gonna scratch my lens, okay? And they, for most lenses, they just twist right off and uh, really easy to snap on and off, and there you have it. Okay, one other thing that I have on here is called a UV filter. Now, this is a very inexpensive filter. Uh, most of the time, they're anywhere between 10 and $25, depending on how big your lens is. And it's just a little filter. It blocks out some of the UV rays, but what it also does is it protects the front element of my lens. Keeps it from being scratched, marked up, scuffed, things like that, okay? Um, if I drop my camera and I have one of these on it, this breaks, protects my front element, I just saved myself a whole lot of money. Cheap insurance, 20 bucks, really cheap insurance, all right? And these just screw onto the lens. And one of the important things to remember with these is you have to buy a filter that matches the size of your lens. So like uh, this lens, for example, uses an 82 millimeter filter size. So I have to make sure I buy an 82 millimeter filter. Otherwise, I'll have a filter that doesn't fit. All right, so those are a couple little things that'll help protect your camera. One of the other things that I highly encourage is using a camera strap, okay? A camera strap is very important because it allows you to hang it over your shoulder, uh, hang on to it. You can also do another little trick when you're hand holding it is wrap it around your arm a couple of times so that way if I'm in a shoot situation I'm shooting and I drop my camera my camera doesn't fall to the ground I've got it right here on my arm and it's not going to fall off all right so another little helpful little tip that you can uh, use to protect your camera protect your equipment we spend a fair amount of money on this stuff we might as well protect it right so that's what we got for today I uh, hope you enjoy the episode this week um, be sure to check us out, our website on uh, www.thedslrworkshop.com. Uh, you can also subscribe to the podcast and iTunes and uh, check back for other weeks. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash the DSLR workshop. All right, that's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Look forward to talking to you next week and uh, hope you guys have a great week. All right, take care and thanks for joining us.